Okay, hello and welcome to today's restorative dental MSC's virtual open day and thank you for joining us. My name is Serena Patel and I'm a current programme student and your chair this afternoon. We hope this session will address the course specific questions you may have and will help you to gain an insight into what it's really like to study on one of our master's programmes. I'm delighted to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Peter Fine, and and there will be a Q&A session for the second part of the event. This session is being recorded and will be made available on our website following today's event. Now to introduce our speaker, we have Dr. Peter Fine. Peter is the Director of the Restorative Dental Practice Programme at UCL, Eastman Dental Institute. He is also the, the director of the master's degree in sports dentistry, oral health and sports here at the Eastman Dental Institute. Um, over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Serena. Thank you for the welcome and, and welcome to everybody uh, listening into uh, this, this webinar this afternoon. What I want to do is to uh, go over a few aspects of the programme, introduce you to uh, what we teach and how we teach it and so on. Um, and then we'll be happy to take questions after the uh, the presentation is is completed. Um, okay. So the idea this afternoon is I want to introduce a little bit about the Eastman Dental Institute to start with and how it fits in with with UCL generally. We'll then look a little bit at the MSc program in restorative dental practice. Uh, and then perhaps uh, also a little bit about why we think you ought to apply to uh, uh, join our program, which uh, will be an application to start in January 2025. So a little bit about uh, UCL to start with. Um, UCL was founded in, in almost uh, 200 years ago now, in 1826. Um, and it actually was founded as one of the, the first university to accept women uh, uh, in its uh, undergraduate training programs. Um, and still today, we have uh, a, a reputation, if you like, of, of being completely inclusive um, of, of all, all students. Uh, it has a very high standing in, in the uh, world ranking at the moment, um, ranked at the moment number nine in, in the world of universities. Um, and, you know, we, we have multidisciplinary uh, programs going on within the university and altogether around about 43,000 students that's undergraduates and, and postgraduate students. We, as part of uh, the uh, UCL the medical school which we are part of the, the faculty of medical science is actually ranked number six in the world at the moment uh, and as you can see from the slide here um, over the years, we've had some 30 Nobel Prize laureates to have come out of, uh, of, of UCL uh, as well. Um, the research uh, aspect, which is a big part of UCL, uh, we are just second only to Oxford University in, in the UK uh, as one of the forefronts of, of, un of uh, research that's going on around the world. Uh, looking at the Eastman now, uh, specifically, so the Eastman Hospital first opened its doors in November 1931, um, so quite some time ago now. And then the Eastman Dental Institute, uh, which was geared up mainly for uh, teaching of uh, graduates, opened in 1938. And uh, we have moved in the last three years um, to our current site within sort of central um, UCL, whereas we were in a, a rather remote site down in Gray's Inn Road. Um, but um, more of that in, in, in a second. We are uh, at the Eastman, the largest postgraduate dental academic centre in Europe currently. Um, and we educate here, not just dentists, but dental care professionals, including dental nurses, hygienists, therapists and technicians. So everybody that comes here is, is gets uh, a first class education through a lot of um, experienced and, and very knowledgeable teachers. Um, the main aspect of 
the research programs that we run are based around biomaterials, tissue engineering, and microbial diseases. And I'll come back to the research aspect later on when we talk about year three of the restorative program. Um, the hospital itself does provide specialist clinical care for patients referred into the hospital by practitioners. And you may be actually a practitioner who might refer uh, cases to, to the Eastman. Um, the Eastman became part of UCL uh, in 1999. Uh, prior to that, it was a sort of separate entity on its own, a separate health authority. And becoming part of UCL had distinct advantages in that we can now offer university-based degrees. Uh, and that's clearly what we're talking about today, uh, the, the university degree, which is the restorative dental practice program that you're um, considering uh, at joining. Um, in 2023, uh, we will rank number 12 in the world. Uh, and um, we, we really look at contemporary dentistry um, and focus on new innovations and new skills so that we can impart that knowledge to, to all of our students. Um, we are now, as I say, right in the heart of, of UCL, the sort of, as you might say, trendy Bloomsbury um, in the centre of London. And um, the picture on the top left-hand side of your screen is the new UCL uh, Eastman Dental Hospital. And this is a hospital that is uh, run uh, in conjunction with ear, nose and throat. And that sort of makes sense in, a, in many respects that dentistry and ear, nose and throat are, are in one specialist building. Uh, the picture in the middle of the um, uh, top row of pictures there is uh, the cruciform building where we have library facilities, lecture facilities. And in fact, uh, many, many years ago before the new hospital was built, this was the original University College Hospital. Uh, the building on the top right uh, is part of a new complex down at Stratford, um, part of University College London East. Um, and uh, although we don't go down there particularly for teaching, uh, there's a new campus being built around, around uh, UCL East uh, on the Stratford site. Picture on the bottom left is uh, the current the fairly new University College London Hospital. Um, and the middle picture is Senate House, which used to be the sort of, still is, I think, the headquarters of London University. And then finally, the picture on the bottom right is the Rockefeller Building, where I'm sat at the moment and where most of the teaching for the restorative dental practice programme takes place. So we have three sites, really, three locations that the Eastman is, is situated in. The first site is 46 Huntley Street, which is the hospital. And most of the programs there are full time programs um, and most NHS patient care occurs in that building. Uh, on the bottom picture there, we have the Rockefeller building, which is uh, opposite main UCL and is the, the hub of the, our teaching, really, and where the EDI Eastman Dental Institute is based. We have face-to-face -face lecture facilities here, clinical skill labs and clinical care facilities all within um, that, that building. And then the third uh, site really is in Hampstead, the Royal Free Hospital in Hampstead in North London, uh, which is the research hub uh, where we look at microbial diseases, biomaterials, tissue engineering. And one or two of our students have the opportunity to go to the Royal Free and do their research project there in year three of the restorative program. Um, hybrid learning um, does come into everything now. Um, we sort of uh, moved a little bit towards this after COVID and during COVID, um, although the vast majority of our teaching on the restorative dental practice program is done face to face, but there are elements of hybrid teaching that can be incorporated as well. So this is a view of one of our new skills laboratories. Um, it's got 90 units uh, for training uh, facilities. 
um, on the fourth floor of the Rockefeller building. And you can see everybody has got their own little station with their own uh, mannequin, uh, hand pieces, computer screen, which is linked to the teaching station, which you can see at the front of the bench uh, in each um, facility. This is often, normally I would say, um, screened off so that we only have maybe 15 or 20 of the um, stations available for each teaching session because we teach in small groups of eight or nine students. So there's no point in having the whole thing open for all 90 units. So we can screen it off into discrete small units as well, which we generally do. Um, and here you can see um, how the area is screened off um, uh, in the bottom right hand uh, image. And then on the left hand side of the screen, we have one of our clinical areas where students um, have an opportunity to practice clinical skills um, amongst each other, uh, particularly things like looking at um, occlusion, how occlusal contacts are, are recorded and so on and so forth. But then they have the opportunity to practice those skills on the mannequins that you will be familiar with, I'm sure. We're very fortunate in that we have um, excellent facilities team who help and supports the teaching days at the, at the um, Rockefeller building. Um, and the girls generally set up everything for you. All your kit is ready for you to go each day, each teaching day, depending on what's being taught. Uh, they will get everything out for you. But if there is anything that is needs replacing or renewing, then we just speak to the, the facilities team and they upgrade things and get those new drills and new burrs and so on and so forth. So everything is pretty new um, and the facilities are, are really comfortable and, and pleasant to work in. Um, we do have the training days, which are most days, in fact, of the program are, are hands-on training days to a certain extent. And what happens generally is that there is some teaching in one of the um, classrooms, perhaps to start off with, a lecture-based or seminar-based teaching, uh, which is face-to-face. -face. And then um, we go up to the skills lab and um, Obviously, if we need PPE, we've got that uh, available to us and we look at uh, teaching the clinical skills that we've been talking about and that we've got uh, uh, knowledge about. So most, in fact, pretty much all, in fact, in, in year one, certainly, of the teaching is face to face. Um, we have got the opportunity to use what I would call an inverted classroom. And this is where we can deliver a lecture. Uh, online prior to the actual teaching day so the students can look at that lecture online and then when they come in for the teaching day um, it's a question of um, discussing what was on the lecture questions and answers and um, a opportunity to discuss the various aspects that have been taught um, one of the things that i think is most important uh, on the on the teaching days is that we do use a lot of feedback. Every student is given feedback uh, on their clinical work that they're doing, as well as on feedback on the assessments that they may have sat as well. Um, and I think this is really important because one of the things that feedback does is help students to then progress their learning, progress their education in, in, a, in a very logical and, and sensible manner. And of course, this requires quite close support so within the groups of, of eight or nine students in, in a, a teaching group, uh, we normally have two or maybe even three members of staff um, supporting that, that day's teaching. So uh, good close support from, from members of staff and um, good feedback to all the students, uh, either uh, uh, within the day or, or as a result of an assessment. The facility, we were very fortunate enough to, to meet um, Princess Anne, Princess Royal, back in, in May 2021, when she came to open the new facility. Um, and um, 
she she was uh, I think suitably impressed with the with the uh, facilities that we've got here now. The picture on the left is uh, Princess Anne chatting to Professor Stephen Porter, who's the director of the Eastman Dental Institute, and on the right chatting to Professor Albert Lung, who was um, the director of the Restorative Dental Practice Program up until last year. Right, I think we'll get a little bit more now about actually what the program really involves would be useful to you. What the program does is it addresses current skills and practices. Now, this is important because this program has been going for many, many years, uh, over 30 years now, and it has evolved enormously uh, over that period of time. It's involved from just a one, one year certificate course um, into now a three-year master's program, university accredited program. program. Um, and of course, you know, dentistry has changed a lot in these last uh, 30 years, and we've kept up to speed with that. So things like, for example, we now include quite a lot on scanning um, rather than impressions, or as well as impressions, uh, could do quite a lot on scanning uh, mouths and so on reading the scans and so on. We also do quite a lot on implant dentistry. Um, not that we actually get students placing implants, but the, rest the restoration of those implants is, is a significant part of year two uh, of, of the program. And so we're constantly updating things uh, and teaching teachers are constantly updating their own skills in, in terms of the, the new techniques and new materials that, that we teach. Um, we think that the programme certainly guides you to many aspects of high quality dentistry. Um, and it's up to you to then decide how you want to use those new skills and that new knowledge that you will get uh, as a result of the teaching that, that's delivered here. It is a, a delivered to a high standard, but um, it is very achievable. Um, and it, this is this is the case because clearly in 30 years, you know, uh, lots and lots of students have been through the system and managed to uh, achieve their goal, which has been to uh, get a master's degree in restorative dental practice. So high standards are um, set, uh, but they are achievable with the guidance and with the support of the teachers that uh, are with you from uh, daily uh, Throughout each, throughout each three year of the program. Um, it is a three year part-time program. Um, it's very flexible uh, from several points of view, but firstly, it's flexible from the point of view of, if at the end of year one, <clears throat> you decide, <clears throat> excuse me, that you have learned what you needed to learn, um, you can then exit at that point with a certificate. Um, we find that vast majority of students actually decide to stay on to year two and learn a lot more. There's a lot more detail, a lot more um, uh, emphasis on uh, bigger cases and that sort of thing in year two. And so uh, they stay on to that. But then there's an exit point there at the end of year two. Or we now find that the, most students stay on and do a research project and complete their master's in, in year three and exit at that point with a master's in restorative dental practice. One of the things with the program is that you sort of learn as you work. So you have this opportunity as a part-time student to be working and to come in one day a fortnight roughly and to learn new skills, new knowledge, new ideas, and then take those away and try them out in your practice and in your clinical area immediately afterwards. And this is tremendously helpful because it gives you then the opportunity to come back and say, I tried this new technique, you know, this worked quite well, this didn't work quite so well, and so on. And then discuss that with the tutors. Um, <clears throat> There's, there is a student loan option as well, which I'll come back to and talk a little bit more about that later on. As far as career progression is concerned, yes, I think this is hugely important. The um, evidence that we have is that students uh, benefit hugely when they go for jobs, if they have managed to get uh, uh, attend the program and not only attend it, but actually get either a diploma or, or a master's in restorative dental practice. 
uh, when they then go for jobs, um, they find that they can actually get much better jobs uh, as a result of having that qualification. So I just want to go into a little bit more now about each year. The first year is the certificate year. It, it's two modules altogether. Um, and it's around 28, 29 days of, of actual teaching that you come in for. Um, it's a mixture of lectures, seminars, tutorials, skills rooms and, and case portfolios that you come in to do. One of the things that we do encourage is students to come in and bring their own cases in. And this is a, a very, very good way of learning because you actually learn on a case that you're actually doing in practice. So we have the two modules, the scientific basis of restorative dentistry one, which is largely sort of intracoronal um, restorations, and then restorative dentistry two, which is largely external uh, coronal restorations. So that's year one. Year two, which is a diploma year, <clears throat> once again, uh, two modules, around 26 days this year, and similar sort of um, makeup of lectures and seminars skills from work uh, and case portfolios. Um, and once again, the, it's divided into these two modules. Um, first module is very much looking at, at advancing what was done in year one, and then the, the restoration in, of dentistry year uh, two is uh, advanced cases, uh, looking at particularly at wear cases, implant work, um, that sort of thing, uh, full mouth rehabilitation, that, that type of work. And in year three um, is the MSc year. This is a one year um, research module um, where we look at how to do clinical research. Um, we look at statistics. We look at how to develop a project, write a dissertation, uh, and it's continually assessed. And you work with two supervisors over the course of that year who are, who are generally specialists in the topic that you've particularly chosen. Uh, as uh, to do a project, uh, a research project on. Um, in the first year, now a little bit more about that. Uh, as I say, the we we looked initially at intracoronal procedures. Uh, there's a three days on periodontology and how perio has an impact on uh, restorative work uh, and how you need to and uh, look at the periodontal aspect uh, of oral health in relation to what you want to do restoratively. We look at sort of diagnostic skills, aesthetics as well, and communication. Um, and that's uh, fairly early on in the year. We have a uh, five day uh, course on occlusion. Uh, and this is important because, you know, if every, every aspect of restorative dentistry has, uh, pretty much has an occlusal element involved in it. We also have um, a three day as course on endodontics run by some of the endodontic specialists here at the Eastman. Um, and we look at the cor extra coronal posterior restorations, extra coronal anterior restorations and restorations of the edentulous spaces with either fixed uh, prosthodontics or, or removable prosthodontics. And one of the things that you would need to do at the dur during and at the end of year one is present four clinical cases. So there's normally an anterior uh, restoration, um, an anterior crown, uh, endodontic case, um, and a crown, a posterior crown, something like that, that uh, you are required to do. And you present this to the tutors and to your fellow um, students. Um, so do start looking for these cases early on. And it's important to have a look and to try and uh, identify two or three cases uh, within your practice so you can build those up and develop those cases so that it becomes a nice presentation, which we show you how to do the presentation as well. And that's one of our students who got the prize at the end of year one. Um, so there's, there is an incentive to do well because there are prizes at the end of each year. Sort of uh, because this is a, a um, university master's degree, uh, there is the requirement for assessments 
And so the sort of assessment in the first year, we have sort of clinical cases that you, as I say, present to tutors and, and colleagues. We also have a reflective portfolio, which gives you the opportunity to consider what you've learned on each teaching day and to then try out new things and re reflect on those things that you've tried and see how you can get along and see how you can improve your technique. We also have um, some essay uh, um, assessment to do. And this is useful because it enables you to sort of develop some writing skills before you come to the final year where you do need to write a, a dissertation. So the essay is quite an important part and gives you a, an opportunity to practice those writing skills that may not have been, uh, you may not have done that in, in fairly recently. And then at, towards the end of the year, we have the MCQ, which sort of generally tests your knowledge about what's been taught throughout that year. Um, now, why should you enroll on, on the programme? Well, I think there's several reasons which are, I'll um, go through here. Firstly, it's, it's very hands-on. Um, the amount of um, hands-on is at least half of each day that you, you're in the department. And that's really important because that gives you an opportunity to develop those skills that perhaps you want to do. It also gives you the opportunity to develop some confidence in doing those particular techniques that, that you've been taught. It's very interactive because it's taught in small groups um, and it's pretty personalized teaching. It's an opportunity to discuss cases with the tutors, to discuss what they're, they're, they're showing you, how it works, why it works and so on and so forth. We do like uh, very much a sort of reflective approach. And this comes back to the sort of reflective portfolio aspect, because if you can go away and think and reflect on what you've actually learned and try out some new things and then re-reflect on that, it gives you the opportunity to, to consider how you might change your clinical practice. Um, and it may be that you say, well, actually, I don't need to change. Well, that's fine. But at least you've given it some thought and some, some ideas. It also, uh, the way you're taught gives you an idea of putting theory into practice. So you learn the theory, you then have the opportunity in the skills lab and in your own um, surgeries to then practice that theory that you have been, uh, that's been taught. Um, and as I said earlier, it, you get bespoke feedback so that this is an opportunity for you to develop um, based on the feedback that tutors give you. Because um, if you're given good feedback, then it gives you an opportunity to move forward and know which direction you need to concentrate your, your efforts on. We do have also some online facilities in terms of Moodle and uh, reading lists. Uh, Moodle is, is UCL's sort of platform that uh, has all the details about the program and, and about tutors and so on and so forth. So you could use Moodle to um, uh, find out about anything you need to know. It also has very many of the lectures and seminars that are delivered are put on Moodle by the tutors so you can re-watch them at a later date if you need it. Um, it the programme is based and geared towards tier two and beyond um, in terms of skills. So that's useful for your own development. Um, and it also suits people who are essentially practice based, but also people that may be considering perhaps an academic pathway in the future um, so that they can develop those sort of skills uh, right from the start. Um, as I say, we're, we're in our 31st year now. Um, so it's you know, a well tried and tested model, but it's one that's being continually updated uh, and evolved over those 30 odd years. And of course, the location is quite attractive in the centre of London with all the facilities that London has to offer. Um, and so many students come, come down and, and enjoy parts of London at the same time. We do have um, many teachers um, who are, vast majority of whom are, are part-time. Most of the teachers are in practice as well. And so this is a really a positive aspect because they bring not just knowledge and skill, but they bring the reality, if you like, of, of um, uh, being in practice on a, on a regular basis uh, 
um, and then coming into the Eastman to do some part time teaching. Uh, and that works really well because then the teaching is not just theoretical, it's really what applies to you in general practice. So there's some names there of people who teach on the programme, um, but that's not an exhaustive list by, by any means. So um, just a little bit more about the flexibility of the programme, um, because we recognise that you are busy in practice. And so this was all set up with busy practitioners in mind uh, and part time learning in mind. So now there are two options when you apply. You can apply to do a part time option, which is a three year program. That's a certificate year, the diploma year and the MSc. And at that point, a student loan is available, subject to eligibility. You have to apply to UCL uh, to get to um, check that out. Um, but you must complete that in three years. The problem is if you take out a loan and you decide to not complete within three years, then uh, you have to pay back that loan, uh, all of it, uh, straight away. So it suits some people, um, but not everybody. The second part is more flexible. So it's a, once again, it's a three-year programme, the certificate, the diploma and the MSc. But you've got you've actually got five years to complete the three year program. So you can afford to take a year out, um, take uh, what we call an interruption of studies, um, and then you can um, come back to us a year later. Uh, but there's no lo student loan possible if you take that, that sort of more flexible option. Um, there's a website here that you can uh, look at and um, find out any more information that you might want to. Although, um, as I say, we're gonna take some questions in a moment, um, but we, we're more than happy to answer your questions after today, if, if any crop up. Um, so there's the two options, as I say, there's the um, mod module flexible uh, study period um, or the part-time one that we've um, just allude, alluded to. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you for taking time out to uh, join the webinar today. And all being well, we look forward to meeting you in January 2025. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for this very informative session. So we will now start the questions and answers. So can you please add any questions to the Q&A box, please? Okay. Okay, so we've got the first question. Um, is there the option of an MPLIN dent in restorative? Um, there, there is. There is um, an option for an MPLIN dent in, in uh, prosthodontics. Um, and um, But this is a full-time role. It's a, normally a three-year full-time programme at the Eastman. Um, and um, there is... Uh, a fairly competitive entry requirements for that. I think they normally take about five or six students a year. Um, but in what happens occasionally is that, uh, and this has happened just last year, in fact, uh, one of our students having completed the um, diploma uh, elements, in other words, the first two years, then decided that they were going to transfer and do a... Um, M. Clindent, and they were accepted, uh, and uh, they're now em em embarking on a three-year uh, M. Clim M. Clindent program. So it's a it's a separate program, but sometimes students from the restorative dental practice program do transfer across. 
Okay, uh, thank you. So our next question is how much teaching is there on implants? Um, the implant teaching comes in year two uh, and it's over uh, two days, I think. Um, and it's basically about the restoration of the implant rather than actually placing implants. It's not uh, anything to do with the surgical aspect. The reason that it's um, just a couple of days is that what we think is that you need to have some sound restorative techniques and skills first of all before starting to do res restoration of, of dental implants so there is a couple of days in year two um and um they that those are run by our specialist implant teachers uh but it's they're done in year two because we like you to have those skills and knowledge from year one before you start doing that Okay, thank you. Um, so our next question, uh, can we formally apply to a specialist in restorative dentistry following the diploma completion or would we have to do the MSc? Um, that's an interesting, that's a good question. It's an interesting question. Uh, in order to be on a specialist register, you have to do uh, specialist exams. The, M the MSc uh, in restorative dental practice enables you to have what's called a special interest in restorative dentistry rather than be a, on the specialist list. But what you can do is you can then transfer from the restorative dental practice program um, in order to do specialist training, but it doesn't actually uh, entitle you to be on the specialist list uh, in terms of prosthodontics or cons. Thank you. So a couple of questions from Elliot. So the first question, it's regarding. Are there any specific requirements for the clinical cases in year one, two? For example, if you're working in a setting that doesn't routinely place or restore implants, then what are the requirements? Uh, that doesn't matter at all um as long as you you've got access to patients in year one um you you will need the clinical cases you will need to present are um for example anterior composite restoration posterior composite an anterior crown posterior endo that sort of thing so things that you're doing routinely in in general practice you don't need to have any any specialist uh implants uh, skills or or knowledge or experience to to do those in year two in the diploma year um, you will need to present one what's called comprehensive case um, and this will involve a multitude of um, skills uh, and uh, and and really treatment planning skill that's that's one of the most important things so the idea is to take um, the skills you've learned in year one, which is mainly sort of one or two tooth skills, if I can put it that way, into year two, where we're doing much more sort of full mouth type of work, that that type of thing. This, the cases for presentation in year two uh, can sometimes be, for example, tooth wear cases, or it could be um, multiple crowns with a removable prosthodontic appliance uh, there. It could be... Um, some uh, end, endo followed by some crowns on the endodontically treated teeth, uh, but it could be the restoration of implant supported teeth as well. Um, it's it's a comprehensive case, so it needs to have uh, all the all the factors there. Um, perio should be good. Endodontics, if that comes into it, should be good. Uh, you, your restorations, but what what we're looking for is how you've actually planned the case and how as well as how you've actually undertaken those those skills that you've, you've learned in the first year or two okay so thank you our next question is the timetable set out for the year um, what is a typical attending date and how likely are the day, days to change throughout the year yeah that's fine in year one um as i said there's about 28 29 days now what we do for year one is we offer the opportunity for you to come in either on a Monday or a Wednesday or a Friday. 
The teaching is the same on each each day, um, but you have the choice of which day you come in. And it's normally once a fortnight that you come in for, for teaching. Um, sometimes people will like to, you know, take a, a Wednesday off and, and come in, break up their weeks. Sometimes people, we have people, I think of a couple of students at the moment who don't normally work on a Friday. So they come in on a Friday, that sort of thing. So it's very much geared to you. It's another aspect, if you like, of the flexibility of the program. In the second year, uh, most well in fact virtually all the teaching takes place on a wednesday uh, because we combine the groups together for, for one group on a wednesday okay so another question is there anything we need to have done or included in our personal statements when we apply for the program um there's nothing you need to have done as such uh, other than the fact that you need to obviously have BDS or some or the equivalent of BDS, um, I think it's better that you have got at least a year's experience. So that may be your vocational year, um, but it's it's really applicable to everybody who's got from say a year's experience to twenty years experience. We've got some students at the moment who've been in practice for fifteen, sixteen years. And we've got others who've been in practice a couple of years. Um, I know I did it myself when it was just a certificate. And I think I'd been in practice for about 25 years when I did it. And it just totally changed the way I um, was practicing dentistry. Uh, so there's no requirements from that point of view, um, other than the fact, yeah, you have to have access to patients because you need to do the, do the cases that uh, we've already alluded to. Okay, and another question, um, can we apply for a tier two accreditation with the local dental body following the programme? Yes, I think you can. I think you can. I, I'll need to check that one actually, but I think that's, that's the case um, because it is certainly tier two, if not higher, uh, the, the, the qualification once it's all done. So we've got another attendee who would like to know if there is an opportunity to attend a face-to-face -face day from the current course to get an idea of the course of teaching or some sort of taster sessions. Mm -hmm. not yeah, that's, that's uh, an interesting one. Um, we do run, as well as running this online uh, session today, we do run regular face-to-face -face taster sessions as well. Um, and the next one is coming up, um, but uh, I have to look at my diary to see the next date, the next date which we run one. But you'd be very welcome to join that. Um, it's just a, a, a morning in, in April, um, but in May, it will probably be a full day here. Um, and that gives you the opportunity. Oh, thank you. Benedict's just put it up. It's the 15th of April. Thank you, Benedict. Um, so the 15th of April will be a half day um, when you can come in and you get the opportunity to uh, meet uh, the, some of the team and uh, the opportunity to look around the place, opportunity to actually do some work in the skills lab and in the clinical uh, suite as well. So uh, the April 15th one is half a day, but the one in May, I think, is going to be a full day. There isn't, sorry, just to complete the, the answer to that, there isn't really the opportunity to come in and um, observe a, a current class in action. Um, but the taster days that we run, the face-to-face -face ones, give you a very, very nice introduction and um, good idea of how things work. So another question, are the teaching days usually nine to five? Uh, almost. Yeah, actually, yes, they're pretty much nine to five because we start off with in the certificate year. Anyway, we start off at nine o'clock with a journal club. And that's an opportunity for you to have been given uh, a couple of articles to read and then um, half an hour, 40 minutes discussion with a tutor about what you've got out of the article, whether you think it's a good article, bad article, whatever. So and then the actual teaching starts about nine thirty and goes through till five each day. 
Thank you. Um, another question, how uh, big are the cohorts? Well, that varies. Um, it does vary. Uh, I think at the moment we've got um, each each Monday, Wednesday, Friday, there's about six in the group, um, in each group. So that would be 18 altogether. But in the past, you know, we've been 30, 35 students altogether. Um, and um, the interesting thing is that with um, currently with sort of 18, 20 students, we do find that the vast majority move from year one to year two and then from year two to year three. Uh, which is which is absolutely fine. That works works quite well. Um, whereas, where if we have sort of many many students, it becomes a little bit more difficult, and we don't get we only maybe get fifty percent transferring from one year to the next. So at the moment, yeah, there's about eighteen in year one, and then I think there's about fifteen or sixteen. Actually, Serena, you'd be able to answer that better than I will. There's about fifteen, sixteen in year two, I think, isn't it? You know, we're in groups of eight, um, as we have two groups of us. Yeah, so that'd be 16, yeah. Okay. Um, so that's all the questions that have been um, asked, answered. Does anybody have any further questions? Um, if you can just add them to the Q&A box, please. Okay, so there's a link there from uh, Emiliana about the, the next taste today. Thank you for that. As I say, if anybody has any questions after this session today uh, that they think of, then, you know, by all means, contact myself or, or uh, Benedict, uh, and we'll be very happy to talk to you or, or email you back with an answer. When is the taste today in May? So we know that there is a taste today on the 15th of April and we'll just try and find out for you when the taste today in May is. Oh. Benedict might be able to answer that. So that's the 20th of May. There's yeah. a moment, there's one also being held on the 20th of May. Okay, so if anybody has any final questions, and if they can please add it to the Q&A box now, please. Um, is there a PDF for whatever will be taught module wise so the curriculum for the program is there a, a pdf available um the content the structure i think i think the answer to that is there could be um i think it's, it's difficult at this stage to give you precise dates in terms of next year although the dates are generally similar to to this year um but i have to um look and see if we've actually got each day booked uh, with a specific topic. Um, so if, who, if anybody uh, wants to know that sort of detail, perhaps you can email uh, Benedict or myself. And um, if, if that's or when that's available, then we can send it on to you. Yeah, I think in terms of modules, you did briefly cover for the certificate year that um, it would be intra-coronal restorations and then occlusion, extra-coronal restorations in the certificate year. Um, yeah. And, uh, and implants and bridges and dentures in the... Yeah, and as Keith has just put in the chat that um, module details can be found on the prospectus page, in, uh, which is available.
So just whilst we're waiting for some further questions, um, I'd just like to share my experiences about the course and uh, what I've found um, to be the most rewarding thing. So again, I think a lot of the things that Peter covered in his lecture that I think the teaching is very up to date. Um, so there's a lot more focus on composites um, as this is mostly being delivered in practices now. And we even covered aspects such as deep margin elevation, which is something again, I hadn't been so sure about. And also, evidence-based bonding protocols as, as well. Also another uh, important aspect of the course, um, it does go into the lab work as well. So it does tie the two together. And I think it's something I hadn't appreciated before as much, but being able to undertake laboratory based components such as pouring up the study models and mounting up models on the articulator, um, waxing up a crown, it gives more appreciation for what I need to do to provide for the, the technician as, as well, okay, so um, to improve my work further. And I think also working with all the other postgraduate students, uh, we can support each other. So when we have cases, we have our own groups that we can discuss it and then also discuss it with the tutors, having the cases from practice that we can seek further advice from, which that's very helpful as well. So yeah, enjoying the course so far. Yeah, I think one of the most Im important things which um, Serena has touched on there is the opportunity for um, students to bring in their cases and discuss them. Uh, that's really, you know, very, very valuable. Um, time spent uh, not just discussing it with with your colleagues but with the tutors as well um what what they won't do is they won't necessarily treatment plan it for you um but if you come in with the treatment plan um and some ideas on what you actually want to do then then that um is a good basis for discussion uh of your own cases yeah, and I think as well, the course, it does help you to become more confident with treatment planning and being able to maybe t taking on bigger cases as well, especially as you progress from the certificate into the diploma year, um, looks bigger cases. So we have a couple more questions. Um, do we apply for funding after the acceptance onto the course or before? Um, I'm going to have to ask, ask Benedict. Um to answer that one, I think. Um, to be honest, I would have to ask uh, our fees team, but we do have a great uh, fees team that we encourage uh, like prospective students, people that are applying to get in touch with as early as possible, um, because they definitely know their stuff and they will have like a phone call, talk through any options, et cetera. So um, yeah, as you're applying, just let me know and I can sort of triage you through and they'll more than helpful. What what I would say is that um, the application, uh, the admissions office for applications actually opens today, um, and it is. Uh, I think it's fair to say that it's actually quite a time consuming. I don't know if you found this, Serena, but it's quite a time consuming process. Um, so the sooner that you apply, the the better, actually. Yeah, it was um, fairly straightforward. Um, but yes, there is, um, it's all listed on the website, how to go about applying all the steps that you need to take. And again, if you're not sure, you can always email the um, admin team as well to assist you further. But I found it to be quite a straightforward process um, as well. So, so, so we just had another question and I think it says, by the end of the diploma year, should we feel comfortable with doing full mouth rehabilitation cases? Um, <laughs> yes and no. Um, I think some people do. Some people are quite happy then, quite feel quite confident to take on, on full mouth rehabilitation cases. Other people are a little bit more circumspect and that's, that's, that's fine. That's absolutely natural. Um, I think uh, there are there are people who um, feel quite comfortable to go ahead and do that sort of thing. But what also happens, and this is this is another point that perhaps is worth worthy mentioning, um, 
just because you finish the second year and you may be in the third year or you may uh, disappear from the, uh, the program, um, the tutors are very willing to look at cases with you and to give you advice and, and support uh, on what you're thinking of doing with those cases. So I think um, it depends very much on the individual. Some of my own personal research was looking at this very thing. Um, and actually I found that um, the majority of students felt a lot more confident in um, tackling the, these major restorative cases uh, following the, the completion of year two. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, uh, the, the uh, ladies uh, amongst uh, our students were actually more confident than the men, which which surprised me. Um, so so that was that was quite interesting. So we've got one more question, and it's something that has been covered already about does the course cover implants? Well, it does. Yes, it does cover implants. It doesn't cover the surgical side of implants, but it covers the restorative aspect of implants. And that happens for a couple of days of teaching in year two um, covers that, that aspect. Um, once you've got some good skills and good knowledge about um, some of the fundamental of restorative dentistry, then we, we feel comfortable that you'll be able to be in a position to restore implants. Okay, everybody. So we're out of time now and we'll need to leave it there. But thank you for all of your questions and comments. And thank you to Peter for an excellent informative session. So have a great day, everyone. And if you've got any further questions, then please um, do reach out to the administration team and um, if you okay. Right, thanks very much, Serena. Thank you.